Very, very, very warm greetings from Zhejiang University. This is President He. Lovely to meet you, President. Yeah. Hold up. So we're going to start. Okay, if you're ready. Great. I'm ready. Thank you so much. Okay. Greetings from Zips, Zhejiang University International Business School. My name is Ben Shanling, the Dean of Zips. On behalf of Zhejiang University International Business School, I would like to welcome everybody to our Global Leaders Series. Global Leaders Series is our most prestigious forum at ZIPS for eminent leaders in academia, in business, in multilateral institutions to share their insights with our scholars and students alike here in Zhejiang University. We are very much honored today to have invited you as our you know, first speaker in the year of the rabbit, okay? And uh, please join me in welcoming, first of all, Professor Brian Schmidt, 2011 Nobel Laureate in Physics and Vice Chancellor of La Australian National University. Thank you. And joining me right now is on my right is our Vice President, Zhejiang University, Professor He Lianzhen. Before we officially start, let's welcome Prof Professor He to say a few words on behalf of Zhejiang University. Yeah. Thank you. Distinguished guests and the members of Zhejiang University and the Australian National University, good afternoon. First of all, please allow me to extend a warm welcome to Professor Brian Schmidt, Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, our keynote speaker for ZIP's Global Series today. As we gather here virtually to embark on this exciting journey of knowledge sharing, I'm filled with a sense of pride and anticipation. The presence of Professor Schmidt today is not only a testament to the strong ties between Zhejiang University and the Australian National University, but also a symbol of the unlimited potential for our educational partnerships and the cultural exchanges between our two nations. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about unprecedented challenges for universities worldwide, yet it has also given rise to a new era of digital learning. At Zhejiang University, a leading university with a rich history spanning over 125 years, we have taken on those challenges head on with our commitment to fostering intellectual exchange and promoting global education. ZIP's Global Leader Series, initiated by Zhejiang University International Business School, reflects our unwavering commitment to fostering intellectual exchange and promoting global education. It provides a platform for world-renowned experts from various fields to share their knowledge, experiences, and the perspectives with our faculty, students, and a wider community. As we tune in today, we have the opportunity to broaden our horizons, exchange in interdisciplinary dialogue, and be inspired by new ideas and the solutions for the challenges of our times. And while technology provides us with the means to continue learning and connecting, I can't help but feel that nothing beats the power of face-to-face -face interaction. That's why I'm looking forward to the opportunities for future in-person engagement between Zhejiang University and the Australian National University. So Professor Schmidt, I thank you once again for joining us today and for being a part of this ZIP's Global Leader Series. Your insights and perspectives are sure to bring new ideas and energy to our university. And to everyone else here today, I would like to say, may we make the most of this opportunity, may our minds be opened, and may we be inspired to make a positive impact to the world. Thank you.
Thank you, President He. As you highlighted, we face enormous challenges from geopolitical to economic, from social to technological, all these things that we are confronted with. And uh, culture and future exchanges are the key. And uh, educational institutions like the Australian National University and the Zhejiang University are critical in that particular process. Last year on April 27th, Professor Schmidt and our president signed an MOU between ANU and Zhejiang University. And specifically, it also highlighted the collaboration between the College of Business and Economics at ANU and ZIPS on our side. Last few months, we have been working very hard to turn your visions, your agreement into real actions. And uh, as part of that collaboration, we agree that we would, you know, all, we would be honored to invite you to speak. So thank you for, you know, for kindly agreeing to speak to us, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, students, scholars, and friends and family members, please join me in welcoming the Nobel Laureate and the Vice Chancellor of Australian National University, Professor Brian Schmidt. Well, thank you everyone. It is a true honor uh, to be here addressing you today. Uh, and so to ladies and gentlemen and to our honored guests, uh, thank you for giving me this pri privilege. I'm joining you today from Canberra and I'm delighted to be delivering today's keynote address in the lands of the Ngunnawal Nambri people. It is custom in Australia for us to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians whose traditional lands I'm speaking from. Their culture goes back 65,000 years. It is the longest continuing culture known on the planet. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. The Australian National University has been built on lands which have been a meeting place for sharing ideas and knowledge for a thousand generations. And so having the university built on those traditional lands, it is fitting that I'm able to uh, share my remarks from a place that has such a long history. Now, I'd really like to thank Zhejiang University for the opportunity to speak today. And I welcome and acknowledge the delegates on today's talk that will focus on China-Australia research relationships, the culture and academic exchange, and where all of this may meet, uh, lead over the next 50 years. These are all themes which are of great personal interest to me. Before I was vice chancellor, I was a researcher at the Australian, uh, the ANU's School of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Mount Stromlo Observatory. It is where I did the work as part of a larger team, international team, that ultimately led to the Nobel Prize in Physics. Through my time as a researcher, I had the opportunity to collaborate and work with people from all over the world, six continents, everything but Antarctica. And this has given me a great insight to how important other people and other perspectives are in shaping research uh, from both an academic and a personal perspective. As vice chancellor, I have gained new perspectives born through seeing the world through our students' eyes. As our chancellor, the Honorable Julie Bishop, the foreign, former foreign minister of foreign affairs for Australia has said, ANU is a mini United Nations with more than a hundred countries represented by our staff and students. And today is the beginning of our new academic year. So out just beyond uh, the building I am in, we literally have 10,000 students out understanding uh, the different uh, societies and opportunities on our campus in something we call Market Day. And it is wonderful to see people look at everything from, for example, working on their Mandarin, if you want to do that, to uh, rockets and rocketry, astronomy, uh, understanding uh, history and everything in between. Now, we have been in a very challenging last three years. And it's for that reason that I have not yet been able to visit Zibs and Zhejiang and I do hope that I will be able to return 
this year, later on in the year. That is certainly my intent. I have personally felt the loss of perspective during the global pandemic, that global perspective, where so many staff and students from Australia, our region, and the world were unable to come to campus. And I was delighted to see the news that international borders have reopened, and I am seeing students from around the world, including China, able to return again after a long time and study face to face. It is important. As indicated, this is the week that uh, our students come and uh, visit campus. And I have enjoyed meeting the many new students uh, from all over the world, including to China, who have traveled to ANU to resume or start their studies. Indeed, we had 11 students from Zhejiang University at, at ANU on exchange over the last several years, and we look forward to having even more students in the years ahead. It's a great place here to spend a semester abroad in the same way it is great for our students to come and visit you. As I look to the years ahead, I want to consider by looking at the last 50 years. The world has changed drastically in the last half century. We have had wars and periods of disruption, but we've also had prolonged periods of peace. Indeed, the last 50 years have been, by global standards, amongst the most peaceful and prosperous that Earth has ever had. It has allowed exchanges and bilateral cooperation to flourish. I go back to the 1960s, and little things uh, can lead to big things. The Chinese-Australian relations reopened in the early 1960s with a visit from an astronomer, an astronomer doing radio astronomy. And it is that visit that ties to the opening up and gradual recognition by Gough Whitlam in 1972. Who would have thought astronomy, academic work on astronomy, could lead to a country's relationships where a third of Australia's two-way trade is with China? It was essentially zero back before that astronomy visit. China's remarkable economic transformation over the last four decades has been nothing short of extraordinary. And this has led to a prosperity for China, but also for Australia and indeed the entire world. China's prosperity has led to global prosperity. And I am proud that Australian policy thinkers and political thinkers in partnership with their Chinese counterparts have played an instrumental role in the domestic and international dimensions of this transformation and have helped shape the benefits we all share today. This includes the likes of Ross Garneau from the ANU, who then uh, who engaged with the then prime minister, Bob Hawke and Chinese leaders from the mid 1980s. They were at the forefront of articulating the benefits that Chinese international engagement would bring to Chinese and global welfare, as well as laying the foundations for realizing those benefits through the development of the huge strategic resource and manufacturing trade relationship, which we now have between Australia and China that I referred to earlier. It is an economic relationship for Australia that is unmatched by any of its other economic partners, including the United States. And what is important to note is the contribution made by creative thinking and intellectual rigor to this legacy to which universities have played such a key role. This partnership did not end with setting our two countries on a course of deep and beneficial engagement after normalizing the diplomatic relationship. It saw the establishment of frameworks of academic and policy exchange. I'm thinking of the ANU team of scholars who, for example, work with Vice Premier Zhu Rongji and his team on the way to China's accession to the World Trade Organization and the entrenchment of deep research collaboration between ANU and Chinese universities and think tanks. Peking University and Tsinghua are two of many such examples, and I am great to see Zhejiang being such a strong partner for ANU now. Indeed, in November at the G20 last year, during the meeting between Australian Prime Minister uh, and your president, Xi Jinping, the president noted how important the relationship with Australia had been in the development of China's strategies towards engagement with the West and the global economic system. 
Together, both our countries are still heavily and jointly invested in the post-war global multilateral order. It is a system that constrains uh, the use of raw military power in the conduct of international affairs that underpins our national and global prosperity and encourages understanding and common efforts in managing the big challenges humanity faces today. Those challenges include problems of climate change, of pandemic management, of geopolitical tensions and threats to economic growth and stability, and how best to generate the big ideas is we need to deal with them. The lessons are there from our past success for the management of the circumstances we face today. And all the world we live in is now vastly more complicated, in part, of course, because of China's success over the past decades, we should consider these lessons as we look forward to the years ahead. Importantly, the principles of the practice, sorry, the principles and the practice of cooperation on which our bilateral relationship was built are no less important today than they were when we called upon them in framing its foundation. Indeed, they are now more important because of the range and complexity of the problems that we need to deal with today, globally and in partnership with the entire world. The past three years have seen immense disruption because of the impact of COVID-19. And COVID has turned us all substantially inward in our own societies, but also in managing the affairs of international society. The physical barriers to human interaction have debilitating consequences for productive exchange in human affairs eating away at the discourse that is the hallmark of civilized society. And I worry that there are structural forces in the evolution of policies, institutions, and national attitudes that have steadily narrowed opportunities of the kind of exchanges that we now need to invigorate our relationship in meeting the challenges of today and tomorrow. At ANU, we have a student cohort of approximately 20,000 students. And although many are from Australia, a large percentage are from overseas. And that is the way ANU has always been. This creates a campus environment that is a literal melting pot of cultures, ideas, and differing identities. It creates an environment that challenges and stimulates our students and scholars and provides the platform for their ideas to be contested and challenged. This is one of the most pivotal roles for academic institutions to see and nurture intellectual creativity and rigor. But we always do it from a position of respect. We have so much to learn from each other. When we talk, that is where we progress. The return of thousands of Chinese students to Australian campuses, including ours, is a welcome step in the recovery from the pandemic, which has impacted every part of the globe. And as part of this recovery, the restoration and expansion of academic programs to put Australian students back on Chinese campuses and to rebuild academic research engagement needs to be a high binational priority. This will not be easy. It will not be without challenges, but it is possible especially if we make it a focus of our joint attention. It will only happen if there are significant policy and institutional changes uh, in both our countries. And those changes are going to require high level consideration and joint policy declaration by the leadership of both our governments. I and the chancellor will continue to advocate at the highest levels to support our students and scholars to exchange physically and academically between Australia and the world. Indeed, the Chinese ambassador, the chancellor and I have met on a numerous occasions and ANU was the first place to host a visit for him when he arrived in the middle of the COVID era. For me, one of the most important experiences we can pride as a national university is the opportunity to meet diverse and different people and create pathways to send our staff and students to other places to do the same. Additionally, in Australia, we need a renewed national commitment to invest in what is sometimes called our nation's Asian literacy. And that includes 
illiteracy in China. In Australia, all the data shows a disturbing decline in our Asia literacy. And it's not just the uptake of courses and provision of programs in universities that is a problem. Though in universities, we do have a very special responsibility. It requires a cultural shift that needs to bring along with it the Asia education of our young people, beginning even in our primary schools. In China literacy, we are favored by the presence of our valued Chinese diaspora that can help with this, but the task is one for the whole Australian nation to consider. Here at ANU, we have the Australia Center for China in the World, which focuses our activities and scholarship with China. And of course, our academic colleges, such as the ANU College of Business and Economics, which has supported today's events and our partnership, contributing to expanding our relationship with China through degree offerings, scholarship, and academic exchange. So here we have a big national task in Australia, and I am proud that at ANU, we have the largest collection of Chinese scholarship outside of China in the world. It is something that covers essentially any facet of Chinese culture, history, and language, and it is something we will maintain because of the absolute importance to Australia and to China to keep an illiterate part of the nation alive. But there is also a big task in China too, where the institutional or regulatory environment has become less friendly towards international academic exchanges than it used to be. We must once again welcome scholars and researchers spending more time on each other's campuses and encourage the opportunity for them to do so. All of my academics who have careers built around Chinese culture need to once again be able to return en masse and interact with the people of China, your scholars, government, and universities. Maintenance of those steady professional exchanges between our university and think tanks has always been a crucial ballast in the bilateral relationship, especially when it was under stress. And I am proud of the role ANU researchers have had at being at the forefront of continuing engagement in thinking through policy positions, strategies, and common interests when times have been pretty fresh, uh, pretty tough. These academic exchanges and broadening and deepening them, uh, I think, have to be a priority. And our joint investment needs to be not just in the future of bilateral cooperation, but also of mobilizing our best minds and their capacities to meet the complex social, economic, political, and environmental existential challenges that face all of the people of the world, and especially our two peoples in the generations ahead. As we look forward, we can draw inspiration from examples of the past, which laid the foundations for successful and fruitful partnership. The real important impact of our bilateral partnerships can be seen in just a handful of examples. One that comes to mind is the solar revolution and one which will tackle the extreme implications of climate change. The science which underpins the solar revolution is a product of an academic exchange between our two countries. That is a revolution in technology that changed the way the world has been able to deliver green energy into the future. And indeed, uh, a researcher uh, at ANU, along with a researcher at UNSW, and two Chinese researchers have just been given one of the world's major international engineering prizes for their development of the PERC technology, which underpins almost every single solar panel seen in the world today. That is what success looks like. Here in Canberra, you only have to drive around the city to see a shift to electric vehicles. And in the next 50 years, it is unlikely that our roads will be tracked by petrol or diesel. I think we're probably only a decade away from seeing most vehicles in Australia being hybrid or completely electric. And as we know, China is not just a major supplier of the vehicles themselves, but of essentially every component that goes in to those vehicles. On the other hand, here in Australia, we provide many of the key ingredients like lithium, nickel, and cobalt that also make those uh, vehicles possible. 
As I mentioned earlier, I'm delighted to see students returning to campus from China, but I'm also pleased and encouraged to see scholars welcome back to our shores and invitations issued once again to visit as well. Late last year, we welcomed the first Chinese think tank delegation from the Shanghai Institutes of International Affairs just down the road from you. And it appears encouraging that the world is finding stability again. And this promises a new beginning, not just for our bilateral relationship, but more broadly in how we manage global affairs. So finally, I wish to conclude my remarks by acknowledge one of the potential challenges in the years ahead, which sits outside of geopolitics, geographic distance or culture classes. And that is technology itself. In Australia, there's been much talk in our media about the development and introduction of artificial intelligence. Here, ChatGPT has been tested by some of my colleagues, myself and my son, who seems to be a particular expert of exactly what it can do. Other university vice chancellors have cautioned about the use of AI changing the way students learn. And I suggest that rather seeing it as a threat, we should see it as an amazing opportunity that is a powerful tool to be harnessed. Now, ChatGPT is not yet, if I can be honest, quite fit for purpose, but it is a glimpse into the future. This type of technology will be instrumental and probably one of the biggest changes we see in the next 50 years. The ability for artificial intelligence to suddenly change the way we do all sorts of tasks in our daily lives is going to happen, I suspect, incredibly rapidly over the next 18 months. And it's going to happen in a way that will emerge and is going to be hard to predict. It's going to be hard to comprehend how we suddenly use this artificial intelligent conversation search engine to help us navigate everything from uh, conversation at the dinner table to learning quickly how to code in new languages. How AI is used in our daily lives is going to change. And what we need to make sure is that we make our lives change for the better. As I look back and we learn from the recent past, I encourage each of us to continue to open the door to no conversations and to support bilateral research, cooperation, and opportunity. For as we have seen, there will be opportunity ahead if we partner and work together as we have done at our best in the past. So on that note, I would like to finish up and I think we'll have a chance to discuss some of the issues, but in summary, I see huge opportunity by which by working together, we can raise all boats in the world. And I look forward, as I said, to hopefully having the opportunity to visit you in person in the second half of this year and put, uh, I guess, real action behind uh, the things I talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. And um, lots of challenges, as you mentioned. You talk about ChatGPT, you talk about cultural and uh, educational challenges, and but also the opportunities. You talk about the importance of exchange and engagement. And between Australian National University and Zhejiang University, there is a bridge, it's like A to Z from ANU to ZJU. <laughs> so that bridge is being established by you and we want to certainly hope that we can travel a journey, travel a bridge and reinforce the bridge a lot, a lot stronger so that the bilateral relationship between the two countries and beyond is stronger. So let me, you know, we have, you know, some of our scholars, students here. I will open the floor for some of the questions. First. Thank you, Professor Schmidt, for your wonderful insights. My name is Faraz. You know, well, there is a groundbreaking discovery from you, Professor, that showed our universe is not only expanding, it's rather accelerating with time. Your research and Zip's philosophy is actually, you know, very, very interesting in 
ZIPS is also expanding to different horizons of the world by forging new collaborations and uh, you know, building new agreements. My question is, you know, as you pointed out, that there is an enrichment witnessed in different parts of the world in technological advancement and innovations. But the problem is many good ideas we have witnessed during COVID-19 are still protected. You know, there are still cultural, economic, and different types of walls which stifle an inclusive world. I was wondering what approaches are needed to actually create, you know, together the dark energy which you pointed out in your research, which will help the free flow of ideas, innovations, and best efforts to different parts of the world in terms of expanding, you know, new collaborations and new knowledge systems for an inclusive world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think the key is to do and not worry about perfection, but rather we start uh, our collaboration <clears throat> and try things out. Uh, I think sometimes we overthink things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that um, what I would like to see us is to start trying things out. Uh, and then be prepared to evolve, evolve them. Uh, I apologize. There's a lot of pollen in Canberra today, and I have a bit of an allergy. Uh, so from my perspective, one of the reasons I do want to come and visit Zhejiang is so that we can kind of turbocharge the things that we're doing. We often are looking for permission right now in what I would describe as a less comfortable global environment than we're used to. And I, I think there is actually more permission to do things than we realize. So I would like to see us come up with a few specific things <coughs> and start actioning them uh, as fast as we can. So uh, don't let the perfect be uh, uh, to slow us down. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. Next question. Okay. Uh, Jules, you want to come forward? Uh, hello, my name is Jules. Um, and uh, my question is for the speaker. Uh, many scholars and professionals say that we have to be more understanding, open minded, or tolerant as individuals or groups when it comes to cross culture. So, for instance, an audience, what would you suggest to achieve this openness, or at least how should we get started? as it is key to those relations on a more personal level. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, ultimately people have to be, they have to trust. And unfortunately, uh, conversing on Zoom, when you haven't met people and interacted with them, that's hard to build up trust. Uh, so I do think we need to probably get together, but being able to, be prepared to uh, discuss things openly and being prepared to disagree respectfully. Uh, I find it quite easy to trust someone when uh, I know that they're prepared to disagree with me respectfully. When people are just quiet and so respectful, but there's no exchange, <clears throat> that's hard to build up trust. So I do think we need to have real conversations about things we care about and be prepared to, to not just respectfully listen, but ask questions that can challenge people's ideas. And again, done respectfully, then it's easy to build up trust because you realize you have the permission to disagree. Uh, and that's a really important part. And it's one of those things that uh, I don't know how it works as well in China, but I do know in Australia and in the West, uh, we tend to either not say anything or uh, conversations can be less than respectful. And we need to find that, that in-between scholastic way of, of uh, talking so we build up trust. Uh, and I think that's what allows conversations and collaboration to really flourish. Any questions from our students, maybe? <clears throat> oh. 
Oh, there's a question online. Okay, good. Somebody online. Okay, good. So there is one question uh, raised in the online. Hello, Professor Schmitz. Thank you for your sharing. I would like to ask you about your opinion of cultural exchange and its social influence between China and Australia. I'm a musician based in Zhejiang, Hangzhou, and I'm doing my research in music culture and how it changed the world. What do you think of the art, music as a cultural tool for empowerment of culture, cross-cultural charity exchange? What's the role of music as a part of culture for better Chinese, Australian society and community? Thank you. So I think it's incredibly important and it goes uh, around through art and music. And indeed we have uh, cultural exchanges here at ANU involving, for example, Chinese art within our China in the world uh, where we have some uh, very famous work uh, done by Chinese artists in digital media uh, that uh, we've been able to show and what it gives people is a commonality because this uh, art is uh, well liked and interacted, especially with younger generations here in Australia and having that commonality where there are cultural overlaps that we share. I think it helps us <clears throat> see ourselves as a common grouping rather than two different groups. So I think it's really essential. Uh, and so I, I sit on something, uh, uh, a granting agency that does cultural exchange and scientific exchange. So that's one of the things that we really like to promote because I think it gives you insights into the other cultures uh, and it gives you those shared things that um, you can hold in common. And it's just much easier to, I guess, understand and get along with people when you share things with them, uh, rather than it being Chinese culture, Australian culture, and they're different. There's a lot of cultural overlap. And I think that is a real secret uh, to the future success. Thank you. We are a lot more similar than we are different. Okay, that's for sure. Thank Indeed. you. Other questions, maybe, yeah. Yes. Uh, hello, Professor Schmidt. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Yuwen. Uh, actually, I'm a graduate from ANU over a decade ago. Now. <laughs> okay. So I'm very happy to see our uh, VC here again right, uh, through this uh, opportunity. Currently, I work here at uh, Zhejiang University, and uh, I listened to your uh, commencement address uh, the day before yesterday, which was very inspiring and also reminded me of my good old days back in ANU where I studied very hard. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very uh, much for participating in this uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, we are very happy. Some of, uh, uh, some of us here like students and young scholars. So do you have, my first question is, do you have any advice for us uh, young scholars here, right? How to like uh, be successful and uh, how to advance in this uh, changing world. And my second question is that uh, during your uh, speech, you mentioned about the climate change is the one key and the complex development challenge uh, in Asia and Pacific now. So uh, as a top university uh, uh, in Australia, does ANU have any courses or degree program or research going on that help us to prepare for climate change and tackle the challenges and opportunities it brings? So that's my, uh, they're my two key questions, two uh, small questions. <laughs> well, the first advice is the advice I always tell people when you're a young scholar is it is really important for you to pursue ideas that you care about, that you're passionate about. Your job is not to follow what other people are doing. Your job is to try to create uh, the ideas, new ideas. So don't be scared to go out and say, well, this is really important to me. So I won my Nobel prize, not because I did what everyone else did. I had a bold idea that quite frankly, a lot of people thought was a little crazy to go out and try to do at the age of 27, but I did it because I knew it was really interesting to me. 
But to do it, it wasn't just me. I had to bring together people from six continents and try to do it as fast as we can. Because what we want with science and technology is to get the answer as fast and efficiently as we can. So try to put together the right group of people that allows you to answer and do what you're passionate about as quickly as possible. And that means reaching over the oceans and finding the right people around the world who can help figure out the things that need to be done to answer the question you believe in. So that's my advice is be bold, but make sure you do something you're passionate about, not something other people are passionate about. And then your job is to convince the rest of the world that what you're passionate about is really interesting, okay? On the second one, uh, so we have a climate change uh, uh, institute led by Mark Howden, one of the uh, main authors of the uh, IPCC. It turns out a third of our faculty are working in areas around global sustainability and climate change. We have a master's course in climate change, in energy transition. So there is a whole range of things we're doing uh, from <clears throat> almost any aspect of the problem, both on the social sciences, how do we get humans to change, the economic sciences, how do we make the transitions very efficiently. Our researchers in engineering have just broke the record for uh, uh, solar voltaics using uh, perovskites, which give you two layers and can give you over 30%. That is probably a way we'll see that technology over the next 10 years going into solar cells around the world. Uh, we looked at storage systems and how you integrate batteries and other forms of storage into the massive grids. Uh, how do you use electric vehicles as batteries uh, to power not just your home, but cities? So there's almost nothing that we don't do. Finance, for example, how do you finance climate change? That's gonna be really important. So a whole range of activities. And those are activities I think we would hope to be able to work with Zibs uh, over the course of the next few years. Okay. I know we are running, well, running short of time, but we do have a couple of short questions probably. Yeah, maybe. A very short question. Do we have a chance to have the Nobel lecture here in Jizang? <laughs> Sorry, could you say that again? I didn't hear it. Uh, do we have a chance to have your Nobel lecture here in Jizang? Wow. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. Uh, when I visit, I am more than happy to tell you about the accelerating universe and everything we know about the universe. Uh, absolutely would be something I would love to do when I visit. Thank you. <laughs> final question? Please? No? Okay. And uh, any final questions? If if no, we, we know that you need to go. So, Professor Hood, do you want to you finally say a few words just to invite? Yeah. So, Professor Schmidt, once again, I'd like to thank you for this uh, very inspiring and the really, I would think, say very important talk. And we are looking forward to your visit. And you know, last year you signed the agreement actually with our former president. <laughs> and he is now actually the vice minister of science and technology. And we have just recently have a new president who is also in the field of physics. So I'm looking forward to your visit and I'm sure you'll be interested in meeting with him. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. And uh, please consider everyone here invited to come and visit us as well. But I do look forward to seeing you uh, later on in the year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also everybody for joining us. And uh, we look forward to the next you know, Global Leaders Series. And of course, looking forward to your visit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.